Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the press conference on two reports today. First of all, apologies for this small delay. Uh, before we start, just a short note. Uh, the chair of the Special Committee on Foreign Interference, Mr. Rafael Glucksmann, who was supposed to be with us here today, will not be able to attend. But we have our rapporteurs here with us. As I said, we are going to talk about two reports, both prepared by the Special Committee on Foreign Interference, or shortly as we call it, ING2. Uh, the first one is the report on foreign interference in all democratic processes in the European Union, including disinformation. The vote in the plenary took place just half an hour ago, and it was adopted by a fine majority. And uh, with us here is the rapporteur, Ms. Sandra Calniete. Uh, the second report is on recommendations for reform of European Parliament's rules on transparency, integrity, accountability, and anti-corruption. It was also put on vote this morning, but in the committee it still has to come to the plenary, and this will happen in July. And the co-rapporteurs, uh, Mr. Vladimir Bilchik and Ms. Natalie Lazo, are also here with us. Uh, the rapporteurs will first uh, present their reports, and after that you will be able to ask questions. So I would like to give the floor to the rapporteur on the report that has been adopted in the plenary today, Ms. Sandra Calniete. Please, Ms. Calniete. You have the floor. So thank you. Uh, I am very pleased to see that you are so many interested in the foreign interference in the democratic processes in the European Union, including this information. It, it was my second report, and in a way it is a follow-up on the recommendations of the first report. The task of my, I, as I saw, the task of my report was to, first of all, to assess uh, what recommendations already are implemented, uh, which ones are on the way, and uh, secondly, also uh, to. Um, to link, uh, to build the link between the uh, situation which is completely different between the one during which uh, we worked on the first report. My first report was passed only uh, one week after there was an atta attack of aggression uh, against Ukraine, and uh, this report was consumed during the time when that uh, uh, war is going on and having the, the uh, deep um, impact on the mandate, uh, content of our mandate of our committee. Uh, so, first about our assessment. Our assessment of the current situation regarding the re implemented recommendations shows that um, uh, we have significantly increased our situational awareness and several necessary steps have been launched. Some are in the pipeline and progress has been attained. If we are and, uh, the Digital Services Act has been passed already in the Parliament. Then there is also a Commission with Democracy Action Plan, which is voluntary, but anyway, uh, Democracy Defense Package is on the way. And uh, also, uh, I know that uh, um, in the Commission, uh, the work is going on on the Act of Artificial Intelligence. Uh, and what is the most important, that um, uh, uh, their growing expertise on uh, uh, different aspects of intervention and forms has been acquired. However, in view of upcoming EU elections in 2024, uh, we still uh, should urge uh, for stronger measures and more coordination to protect our Euro European democracy. Uh, so the, the general uh, direction is uh, Reactive, that is, approach centered on fact checking, debunking, and other technical um, aspects. But instead of that, what we are uh, suggesting that we should focus on resilience building and vaccination of our societies against disinformation. And 
Therefore, we need to establish a dedicated European program to invest in our democracy in a sustainable way. It will not give a solution tomorrow, and it will be expensive, but it is certainly a worthwhile long-term investment. Uh, what also uh, is of concern that EU still is suffering from a fragmented approach without the clear coordination and mechanism and goals when uh, is trying to tackle the disinformation. And that is a sort of compartmentalization which we cannot um, afford uh, in the period when democracy is uh, living under the uh, persistent and permanent attack. And then also um, there are um, sanctions which are applied to different uh, perpetrations. Uh, um, what we are proposing that um, uh, we, we should greatly raise the cost of those perpetrators who uh, uh, manipulate for inter information and interfere in our democracy from the third countries and that uh, to the current uh, legislation of sanctions, also sanctions against these actions based on objective criteria are um, introduced in EU legislation. And then uh, just really a few words about the future, because when we are thinking about mm, structural uh, priorities and uh, new challenges, then there are several. Uh, firstly, what the report is proposing, that we switch from the current country agnostic approach when we are treating foreign influence efforts uh, to the, uh, toward, towards risk-based um, approach, which is based on, the, on ob objective criteria. Because we have to be aware that, that uh, the, the which is the source country where from this information come, what is the aim of that disinformation, what is the scale and the impact of that disinformation. And uh, about artificial intelligence, few words. Um, so far, it is quite easy to the, identify the, 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 what is fake and what is not. But with artificial intelligence, uh, the creation of this information of scale becomes much easier and cheaper. And the, the last challenge what I see, which is permanent, uh, but if the, before, during 20th century and even before it was not so harmful, uh, I'm speaking about decision-making process. It is too slow. Uh, uh, because the digital revo revolution is something which is technologically going very fast and reality is lagging far behind it. And this is not only European problem, that is a global problem and this challenge we have to address together with like-minded uh, partners. I think I will conclude there. The report is very detailed. It was a long journey, but it was done in a very comprehensive and uh, cooperative uh, atmosphere, which is not always evident among the political groups in European Parliament, which, is, which testifies that we all understand the complexity and difficulty of the period we are going through. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kalniete. And now the floor goes to the co-rapporteurs on the report on Parliament's rules on integrity and transparency and how to improve them. So shall we first give the floor to Mr. Bilczyk? Thank you very much and a very good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Uh, first, let me congratulate uh, Sandra Kalniete uh, on her report and the successful uh, big support in the plenary. Uh, I also want to thank my co-rapporteur, Madame Loiseau, for great cooperation. And I want to thank uh, everyone who took 
part in the votes uh, in the committee this morning on our final report in this special committee, uh, and uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, we carried it with a uh, decisive majority of uh, 25 members out of the 31 who took part in the vote. Uh, and I think that also underlines the point already mentioned by Madame Calnet that we have worked in this special committee uh, in a consensual, cooperative way. Uh, this final report was produced um, within uh, a limited period of time, uh, and I want to thank everyone engaged and involved in this. Uh, I think we have covered a lot of ground in this report, and I think it sends some very clear political messages. Let me say at the outset, these are political recommendations, uh, which look at the way we should tackle the issue of integrity and transparency of our work in the European Parliament, but also beyond in cooperation with EU institutions and member states uh, in medium to long term. We are not drafting legislation in this document. Uh, we are clearly giving political signals what has to be done. And I think those signals uh, are quite clear. And let me uh, give you a snapshot of uh, the key uh, messages. Um, if I should uh, sum it up uh, in one sentence, our goal has been to uh, reinforce uh, much greater awareness in this parliament, but also across the EU institutions, of the kinds of threats we are exposed to from the outside. Uh, so to uh, really um, underline that we need to raise security culture uh, in this parliament if we want to remain and open and democratic institutions. We have to be aware of the threats that uh, we are facing, and I think we did strike uh, a right balance in terms of uh, what uh, we um, achieved. Our starting point, and also uh, very much uh, the uh, guiding principle over the 14 points uh, adopted by the President uh, Metzola and endorsed by political groups in this House. Uh, this was really the benchmark for what uh, we are doing in our final report. Uh, and uh, uh, these points were also very much um, taken on board and supported uh, by the whole body of the text and, of course, by those who voted uh, in uh, favor of it. Um, if I can be very practical in terms of um, uh, layman's language, uh, what we are trying to do is uh, the goal of our recommendations is not to follow uh, the members of this House 24-7. Frankly, no one wants to do this and nobody is capable of uh, doing this. But the uh, uh, goal is to tackle the existing structural uh, deficiencies and to reinforce preventive measures um, across the board so that uh, we are better equipped to face foreign inter interference from authoritarian regimes. Um, if I am to um, give you the key takeaways, uh, let me, uh, let me uh, tell you that uh, um, basically the European Parliament, and this is our goal, must remain an open institution. We must remain an open institution. There are thousands of people who come in and out of this House, uh, but we are, uh, we are also in a position when we uh, have to confront the malign threats which we are facing uh, in our parliamentary work much more diligently. Uh, we reacted with strong immediate measures um, already following the Qatargate uh, cases, um, and uh, um, of course it is uh, in our utmost interest uh, to um, uh, go further with certain steps, especially when it comes to fighting corruption and undue foreign interference. Um, what did we adopt in these recommendations? We are calling for appropriate security clearance for Parliament's officials, political group staff, and to evaluate when the security clearance is needed also for parliamentary assistance when dealing with foreign affairs, security and defence uh, or trade issues. We also want to have open source screening of trainees, APAS, political group staff, parliament staff, external contractors for possible vulnerability to non-European influence. In short, better checks of potential security risks of various EP contractors as well. Uh, we also want to have comprehensive check of all technology used in the institutions in order to exclude providers from autocratic states, especially Russia and China. We would like to strengthen the rules regarding official missions carried out on behalf of the European Parliament. Um, members of this House shall consistently and routinely ensure that it is clearly stated 
and appears publicly that they are not speaking on behalf of the Parliament if they espouse different positions to those adopted by Parliament during most recent votes. This is especially important when we travel abroad and we travel on our official <coughs> missions. Uh, we uh, support mandatory transparency rules for trips by members of this House that are paid by foreign countries and entities. Any activity or meeting of any unofficial groupings of members that could result in confusion with official European Parliament committees will be banned. Uh, we emphasize that third countries should interact with the Parliament through the Committee of Foreign Affairs, existing official parliamentary delegations, and other relevant committees and, uh, and uh, the Democracy and Elections uh, Observation Monitoring Group as required. We have relevant uh, institutional bodies in this House, and we want to reinforce their position. Uh, these are our official channels for dealing with foreign partners. Um, we also want to make it mandatory for members of this House who draft reports or opinions, uh, uh, especially on external relations, to attach at least to demonstrate the range of outside expertise and opinions that the rapporteur has received. Uh, we uh, are asking our uh, members to publish all scheduled meetings with third parties and interest representatives. Um, uh, we also call on members to harmonize laws uh, on member states, and this is the extension beyond the European Parliament. The reinforcement of our security culture is only going to hand, work hand in hand with uh, changes in the other EU institutions and in cooperation with member states. And we want the member states to harmonize laws on foreign interference and to ban foreign donations to political parties and foundations. We call on Parliament services to establish a monitoring system and rules for revoking access to former members of this House to lobby the Parliament on, be on behalf of high-risk countries beyond the cooling-off period. And we have an agreement on a uh, cooling-off period, um, which is six months. Uh, and uh, we also welcome the recent Commission's proposals to establish a new sanctions regime to target serious acts of corruption worldwide. So this is uh, uh, a snapshot of some of the major issues. There is more in the report. I invite you to read it. I'm very happy to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you for this introduction. And now the floor goes to Mr. Bilcik's co-rapporteur, Ms. Natalie Loazo. Merci. Je vais parler en... Thank you very much. I'm going to speak in French. First of all, I would like to thank uh, my co-rapporteur, uh, Vladimir Bilchitz, and also congratulate uh, uh, Mrs. Gagnetti on the adoption of her report. Uh, with the report uh, that I uh, jointly drafted with Mr. Bilcher, we wanted to take uh, the destiny of our parliament uh, in hand where, when it is subject to attack, uh, trying to influence our d uh, decisions and undermine the confidence of citizens in the democratic institution that we are. We uh, worked together with great commitment and we worked very quickly and with great energy and I would like to thank uh, the shadow rapporteurs who worked together with us uh, in a, a very short period of time and also all of the teams that supported us. Uh, Vladimir Vilcic said, oh, this is a political report, but it sets out very clearly what we want. We want greater transparency where there wasn't uh, sufficient transparency within the institution previously and better protection of our work where uh, that is currently insufficient. A political report, but with very specific uh, recommendations. I won't uh, run through the whole list because uh, Vladimir Bilgit just did that. But on transparency, it is important for us that uh, an independent ethical body is set up uh, which is um, one with investigatory powers and also able to make proposals for sanctions. It is important to do more and to do better with regard to the transparency registry, more and better so that it covers more and that it is better respected, more and better on the publication of the meetings uh, that we have as members of the European Parliament, more and better on transparency of um, secondary uh, uh, revenues for those who have a secondary income, and also clarification on friendship groups uh, that sometimes have created great confusion in the Parliament uh, when there are uh, delegations from the Parliament which are official uh, running in parallel 
and also on the protection of our work. It is the first time uh, that the Parliament has made a statement about security of its activities. And I think it was high time for us to do that. As Vladimir has said, we want an accreditation procedure for the most sensitive issues. We want training for the uh, security agents, and we also want to pay careful attention at recruitment as carried out by the Parliament. And uh, we need to have increased activity on cyber activity. You will be aware that the Parliament has been subject to a number of cyber attacks, but also access to uh, the Parliament, not the access uh, by professional journalists, of course, but but uh, we know that uh, we want to be an open uh, uh, institution, but uh, sometimes it leaves us open to those with evil intent. And uh, as to the um, report by Mrs. Kenyette, uh, we wanted to, uh, to move away from the agnostic approach because we felt uh, that we have to take this... Uh, with the, uh, of having to uh, take the same measures for everyone. We know what high-risk actors are. They are those who have already carried out attacks. And uh, for um, uh, the, uh, those uh, representing these high-risk countries, we need to have specific attention uh, for their action uh, access and for their interaction uh, with uh, members of parliament, but also as to what we as members of parliament should and should not do in terms of side jobs, as people call them, and also for the cooling off period. We do not want the European Parliament to find itself in a situation tomorrow where, as we've seen in the past with some governments, that uh, people were leaving and then going to work for Gazprom or other entities that are close to um, and powers that uh, do not wish us well. And attention being paid as well to the question of transparency for NGOs. This is a delicate issue, uh, but we uh, fully appreciate how delicate it is. But we cannot overlook the fact that if uh, we learned uh, from Qatar Gate, uh, 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 which happened within our own parliament, we also learned that an NGO, a, a bogus NGO, was a vehicle for this and the report was voted in the special committee this morning. Uh, it's a good signal that was sent with that vote. It indicates that our colleagues collectively don't want to be the targets anymore of these attempts to influence in unofficial ways the work being done and to have an influence on our decisions or even an attempt at corruption. But we want uh, it to be uh, um, actors for transparency. That is our duty to our citizens and in order to allow us to carry out our work. And I hope that in July the spirit will be the same. I can't be entirely convinced of that yet, having heard some of these statements which were made this morning during the plenary debate by some of our colleagues who continue to say that there's no Russian interference uh, 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 at the, on the far right and the far left of our hemicycle. But I hope that reason and responsibility will return when the report is voted on. And, of course, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you to the rapporteurs. And now we are ready to take your questions. Just uh, before you ask, tell us your name, the media you represent, and uh, who from the rapporteurs you would like to reply. Uh, and also for those who are following us online, if you have a question, please uh, press the raise hand button and we will open the microphone for you when your turn comes. So we have first uh, Eddie Wax from Politico. Yeah? Thanks, yeah, Eddie Wax, Politico. Um, so I have three questions for the two rapporteurs on the post Qatargate reforms. Um, on friendship groups, I mean, the President announced that friendship groups will be banned. Now it seems in the report that then only banned if they overlap with pre-existing bodies mm -hmm. of the parliament. So can you explain why there was a, you know, walking back from, from, from that? Um, and are friendship groups banned or not? Um, secondly, it seems like, you know, the, the, the reports um, 
there's a lot of talk of trainees, of assistants, of contractors, of staff in the parliament. You know, we need to check them out. We need to see, you know, are they corrupted? Are they working secretly for other countries? But in the Qatargate scandal, we've had four MEPs who are charged with corruption. So it's, it's MEPs that that seems to be the problem if you look at this, uh, at this scandal. Why is there not more about stopping MEPs from, from being um, corrupted while they're in office? Um, and thirdly, I mean, the, this, this report was, was pitched by the Parliament as the really um, the big moment, these longer-term reforms that were really going to go much further than the, the mere sort of first steps proposed by Metzola in her 14 points. But how confident are you that this report really does do that? Does this really, would this really stop a future Qatargate-style scandal from happening? Or have you really just kind of picked different things that are already ongoing and put them into a report which is easily digestible for other MEPs? Thanks. Maybe I will answer first. Um, how can we make sure that nobody's corrupt? We cannot make sure that nobody's corrupt because rules were well known against corruption. There are in, in every single national uh, rules. You are not supposed to accept corruption, whether you're an MEP or uh, an assistant or, or, or whatsoever. But we can take preventive measures against all weaknesses. And weaknesses come through what we have uh, listed as uh, loopholes, uh, considering existing or, or, or past surprises that we found. You do remember that uh, the very daughter of Kremlin's spokesperson was a trainee in the European Parliament. I'm not sure she came out of passion for European democracy, and I'm not sure she was hired for her special competences on European affairs. So this is a reality that we want to avoid in the future. Um, on uh, whether um, that makes a big change for the future. I think so, having, having said that we had never addressed the very question of security of our work uh, because it was seen as unnecessary. The more transparent we were, the better. The problem is that we were not sufficiently transparent on an individual basis, but sometimes much more much too transparent to foreign interferences and uh, attempts to know uh, what we were doing on sensitive matters. So we are trying to uh, rebalance the whole thing. It goes further than the 14 points uh, put forward by President Metzola and endorsed uh, by the Bureau and the Conference of Presidents. We consider it's, it's a good start, but it, we consider we had to go much further than that. And we do hope at the moment the report is adopted in the plenary to go to the president and say, here is your roadmap. Feel free to uh, use it uh, and we will monitor what's being done. And as you know, there, there is a process in the Constitutional Affairs Committee which has to turn it into legal uh, details. Uh, but there, there is the political roadmap. On friendship groups... Um, we don't want to uh, have a copy of official delegations uh, made by OPAC friendship groups. We do want that if there are friendship groups, they follow rules, they are transparent, uh, and uh, they abide by uh, the positions uh, voted by the majority in the European Parliament. But we also have to acknowledge that there are friendship groups for regions which are not nation states. When there's a friendship group on Uyghurs, when there's one on Kurds, when there's one on Scotland, or uh, when there's one on Taiwan, there is no official delegation of the European Parliament for obvious reasons. But there's no reason not to have a friendship group, but the friendship group has to comply with transparency rules uh, and with respecting the position of the European Parliament. Thank you very much uh, for excellent questions. Um, 
Let me start with uh, a more general remark on the Qatar Gate. Our committee uh, is not has not been an investigative committee, and in fact, uh, as members of this House, for us, uh, there is nothing to investigate in terms of uh, what happened uh, with the specific cases uh, which are in the hands of the justice system in the Kingdom of Belgium. Uh, also, um, and this is uh, a public fact, uh, we know very little facts so far uh, from the actual investigation. This was not uh, – the purpose of our report was not to um, – uh, draw specific lessons from something we know very little about, but rather to react uh, to a symptom of a bigger problem. And the bigger problem is that our institutions are exposed and those who operate within these institutions, both elected members and many people working here, uh, may not always be aware of the nature of threats and exposure. And this is what the report tries to bring in. It is also a much more comprehensive document than the 14-point plan or any of the resolutions which were adopted in the plenary very quickly, often within hours, as a political reaction to uh, what uh, was a huge problem, but at the same time uh, a gross failure of certain individuals. And yes, Natalie Loazo is right. No report, no rules will prevent uh, anyone from uh, being corrupted if he or she wants to be corrupted. But we need to have uh, much better checks and balances in place, and we need to be much more aware of what the potential threats are to our work, uh, both in terms of uh, information security, political work, corruption, um, and uh, um, you know, undue political influence, all of these things. And I think in that sense, uh, we are providing a, uh, a very good blueprint for further steps. Uh, we have worked on it in a limited period of time, but also very intensely, not just engaging uh, the uh, members of the committee, but also work closely with members of other committees, foreign affairs, constitutional affairs. Uh, we had uh, consultations with uh, the relevant people who are working on the reform on the, of the parliament. We engaged the relevant DGs and services trying to understand also what is practically possible. We want it to be practical. And for a lot of things, if you want to be practical, uh, you may need to change certain procedures, rules of procedures, uh, while respecting the freedom of the mandate of the members of this House. Uh, so in that sense, the report is nuanced. Yes, there are nuances. But I don't think there is any contradiction between what the President of this House is committed to when it comes to uh, the friendship groups and what we are saying in the report. I think it's very much in line with uh, the uh, idea that uh, uh, we may allow friendship groups only where we cannot have official institutional bodies of this House to deal with countries such as Taiwan, for instance. Uh, and I think this is uh, precisely what we are trying to do, uh, and uh, this is precisely uh, what we are offering to this House to relevant uh, standing committees, to the COP uh, and to the leadership to take it up. Some of the changes uh, which may stem from this will require perhaps uh, initiation of legislative change, rules of procedure. This is going to take months, perhaps even longer than months. It may be a question of a year or two. Um, and uh, I think we need to start doing this. But most of all, and you asked about uh, you know, the training, um, uh, screening, I think these are the measures we can implement tomorrow. We can start doing this tomorrow. And this is probably the best thing which could come of this practically uh, for this House, because that will raise uh, the awareness of the threats and the security culture, which we desperately need to inject in the work of our institutions. Can I just quickly follow up on that? I mean, there is a contradiction, I would say, because the President literally said all unofficial friendship groups with third countries will be banned. Um, so the fact that that's not going to happen, you know, <laughs> strikes me as a contradiction. Um, I think we can have official friendship groups, and I think we don't need to discuss how to, how to establish okay. those. I think there is no contradiction. Would, would, can I ask one more question about the, the Abraham Accords network that's now being set up in the Parliament? Do you think, do you know, do any of you think that that is... Is that a friendship group? Is it an unofficial friendship group? Is it an official friendship group? What, what is it? Should it be allowed? Um, 
I heard about uh, discussions about it. Nothing has been done yet. Uh, we need to know more about it. Uh, what is it? Uh, what's the purpose? Uh, we strongly advise uh, every initiative to uh, reach out to the Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, every time we are dealing with third states, uh, this will be discussed within the, the, the Foreign Affairs Committee. But uh, to my knowledge, uh, I heard about it uh, from some voices, but it hasn't made either a significant progress or there were no documents spread around uh, this house to allow me to answer your question. Well, thank you. Do we have any more questions? Yes, the colleague here. From North Brittany Radio, I'd like to know whether or not to restore the image of the European Parliament, particularly in the regions that are very far from Brussels, you are cooperating with other institutions such as the Committee of the Regions, the Economic and Social Committee, that have people who are uh, local and sometimes these people are better known and better respected than the members of Parliament uh, from the European Parliament. Thank you. Alors, uh, puisque la question est posée, uh, given that you asked in French uh, by a French journalist, I will respond in French. Uh, the uh, probably the most pro-European region of my uh, uh, country of origin, uh, uh, Brittany. I'm very happy to answer. It's not because um, uh, uh, it in. It would appear that uh, some of our colleagues had uh, uh, behavior uh, which which um, was not in line with the law, that there's a loss of confidence in, in, in members of the European Parliament. I, I won't accept that because if you're saying that the members of the, uh, the Committee of the Regions or the Economic and Social Committee are better known, that is true in some cases, but it is not true in others. Some are excellent, some are a little less excellent. But this kind of competition, uh, uh, everyone's rotten in the parliament and uh, it's better elsewhere. I can't accept that. Uh, that may be your opinion, but it is what I have been reading sometimes in some of the amendments uh, coming from uh, some of the colleagues on the far right uh, who want to disseminate this message, everyone's rotten. It's uh, the, the same people that we heard to, talk the most about Catalate on the first day. They're the same ones who made amendments to ask us to delete some of our positions. And it's the same ones who are preferring to say everyone's rotten. So I think we need to be very, very careful about the conclusions that we draw from an investigation which is underway and uh, what we've been reading in the press, it's not completed, and it certainly does not uh, uh, represent the integrity of uh, the large majority of our colleagues. And furthermore, we do work very uh, regularly with the Committee of the Regions and the Economic and Social Committee, and uh, we didn't wait for Catergate to start that work with them. Maybe I can just say a couple of sentences. I just had a group of uh, visitors also coming from the uh, Committee of Regions. Uh, they're asking questions about this, and we regularly consult uh, the two committees, uh, which are next to our institution. I think it's also a good point uh, when it comes to um, how to further work together uh, with the other institutions in in this town, uh, not just including the advisory committees, but also the Commission and the Council of the EU once we adopt the report in the plenary. I think we are all in this together. Uh, so uh, the more interest there is going to be and the more cooperation there is going to be, the better equipped we can be to uh, defend ourselves against undue foreign interference and uh, uh, undue influences on, on the work of this House. Thank you. And uh, anybody else in the room with a question? Uh, yes, please. Sarah Wheaton with Politico. Sorry to monopolize. Um, 
Uh, Vice President Yarova, uh, Commission Vice, Vice President Yarova this morning um, said that uh, they're going to um, push back the planned debut of the Defense of Democracy package in order to do an impact assessment. Um, are you concerned that uh, this process won't be completed ahead of the of the elections? Any any issues, or do you, many NGOs think that they were rushing, and so this this actually is the wisest course? Uh, we also uh, touch on this issue in, in our report, uh, and we would like to see an answer uh, to empower uh, the institutions, especially to protect uh, the uh, electoral framework as soon as possible. Um, at the same time, I think um, uh, um, I take note of uh, the Commission's decision uh, to look at impact assessment. And in some respects, I can understand uh, why the Commission is going ahead with this, uh, given already uh, the discussions we've had also in this House on uh, some of the uh, ideas which uh, have been uh, proposed. Uh, I think that package has to be as comprehensive as possible, and I think in that sense it is good that uh, we will have an impact assessment. Uh, and uh, I do hope that this means that it may make our work uh, um, a bit, um, uh, a bit uh, uh, faster when uh, the Commission presents the package in coming months. Ms. Calnieto will also... Yeah, I, I would like to add, uh, democracy defense package is a very comprehensive uh, uh, f uh, proposal. Uh, and uh, what is important, uh, that there is a quite a good communication on the content of mm -hmm. this draft proposal. And I think that impact assessment provides commission currently with a time uh, window to make that communication. Uh, and I agree fully with uh, those who say uh, that uh, we have to dissipate this uh, idea that this is something rushed. It's not rushed. The problem, as always, is that the reality is uh, pushing us to act First of all, to adopt the legislative or uh, recommendational or political uh, documents and then to implement them. Uh, you know, we are approaching uh, one year uh, period till the next elections, and that is also something which has to be taken in very seriously in, into account when we decide how to proceed. Thank you. Anybody else here in the room with a question? That seems not to be the case in online. Uh, not. So if there are no any more questions, thank you very much for being with us here. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for to our three rapporteurs, Ms. Kalniete, Ms. Lazo, and Mr. Bilchik for their replies. And thank you all for participating. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you, Nathalie.